So you mentioned uh, Gibbs E5, uh, so this might be a link to King's. When did you become a fellow of King's? I became a fellow of King's in 1959. Hmm. And of course, uh, it was a very interesting uh, episode, and the reason was that Noel Lennon at the time wanted to make Francis Crick a fellow uh, earlier than that, mm. and uh, failed to get, uh, although his name was put forward, uh, it was not supported by the fellowship electors. Uh, later, uh, I had the opportunity of seeing some of the letters written, mm. and they're quite interesting, <laughs> quite interesting. So Noel wanted someone from molecular biology, and he spoke to John Kendrew, and uh, John said, well, what about Sidney Brenner? I knew Horace Barlow very well, Horace was a fellow, and so I was put up for a competition uh, external competition, and, uh, and although I was over age, I mean, having done so much mm. in the time, uh, I was, I was uh, not. Uh, I think that they counted my medical degrees, so the fifth year, but no one declared me mm. eligible, <laughs> and. Uh, and then what happened was uh, I was in this competition and then I got a letter from Churchill, which was just being founded, inviting me to become a fellow. So I thought about it at the time and said, well, I wasn't much impressed by all those college nonsense, mm. but if I was going to have it, I wanted the real. You know, the real authentic mm. one. And King seemed to embody that, whereas mm. Churchill just sort of looked like an IBM study, you know, out there and wouldn't be the real thing. You see. So I turned it down. Noel happened to be the chairman of the academic committee. And uh, he phoned me up at the lab when he was told I turned the Churchill thing mm. down. And he said, and I went to see him, and he said, well, why did you turn it down? I said, well, I'm up for the king's thing, uh, but, uh, you know, because I think if I want it, I want the real thing, you see. So he said, but, you know, we can't guarantee it, and so on. So I said, well, if I don't get this one, I'll go without one. I mean, I'm going to need. He says, well, I have persuaded them to hold the offer open till after our election. And of course, I was elected. Mm. And I got a, uh, there, was a, there were two of us that got this. And so I was, Giles Brindley got the named scholarship, the named fellowship. And I got elected under the notwithstanding statute, <laughs> which I've always felt is useful to have in anything. <laughs> You've been a fellow of King's for a very, very long time. Um, can, are there any people in King's um, who you were close to and who you'd like to talk about? Well, um, I... You know, one of the things that I did at Oxford, and that's because uh, uh, I got introduced to him, was a man called Dawkins. Oh, yes. Dawkins was a tremendous character, but of course he was a fellow of Exeter College. This is Richard, is it? No, no, oh. no, no. This was a man who was a professor of medieval Greek in Oxford. Oh and uh, was well known uh, for his relationships with Rolf, you know, Hadrian. Oh, yes, yes. That yes. quest for Corvo, yes, he yes. appears there. Yes. That's, of course, where Shepard appears as well. Yeah, really. And Shepard and Dawkins were great <laughs> friends. So, I used to go and have tea with him in Exeter College and be fascinated by all these accounts mm. 
of this. So when I came to Cambridge, I spent, I used to go quite often to have tea with Morgan Forster. Oh yes. And just to, you know, uh, just, just effectively talk there. And of course I had many friends there who were outside uh, the subject of science, which is one of the great benefits of the college. Mm. You don't have to uh, keep, you know, your social and working life is all the same, in, mm. as mm. indeed in America that mm. is the case. So and, uh, amongst the people I was very close to, were people like Francis Haskell, mm. Michael Jaffe. Mm. I was I was, was totally amused by Michael Jaffe. <laughs> he gave a rather. Um, Frosty air to younger people sometimes. He did, he did, and he was also a monster so far as the servants were concerned. Mm. But you know the famous, there's a famous story about Tony Tanner and Michael. Mm. No, tell me. Michael Jaffe said, uh, You must come up to my room to see my Bronzelli. Mm. And Tony thought, Who the hell was Bronzelli? Bronzini, yes. <laughs> he's racking his brains to say something useful. Michael comes outside with, with a little elephant in bronze. It was bronze, Ellie. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, Michael was there. And of course, I was very much, I very much liked A.D. Rylands. Mm. And I spent, you know, a lot of time there. Mm. with a lot of people who were outside the subject, mm. which I thought was one of the great benefits of the college. Mm. When, when uh, we first met, which was on the senior, uh, when I was a senior research fellow, and it's the fellowship electors in 1972-73, yeah. um, among the people there were Dan McKenzie, um, Bernard Williams, Bernard Williams uh, yes. Edmund Leach, um, yeah. were any of these? Robert Bolgar. Robert Bolgar, yes. Dan Brown, yeah. um, Hal Dixon, probably. Yeah. Were any of these people who. Well, of course, Bernard was, uh, became and was for a long time a very close friend. Mm. And I didn't put his name in because I thought you wanted to hear about the older generation. <laughs> Mm. But of course, Bernard was a very important uh, person for, for many reasons. Mm. And uh, Robert Bolgar, I found, was an astonishing man because mm. I served with him on the electors for more than 20 years. Mm. In fact, uh, I think that the Bolgar bottle, <laughs> which is an endowment of mine, now has become the Bolgar Williams because the fund has been increased twice. I thought at the end of fellowship electors, which mm. were rather heated, <laughs> and this, that everybody should relax and drink mm. a glass of wine. Mm. And this was done in memory of Robert mm. uh, when I he see. died. You see? So it's called the Bolgar Bottle. Ah, oh, I wondered how that Everybody, <laughs> I, mean, I still think it's being drunk mm. now. Mm. I just gave an endowment. Mm. The, the value of which generated, even with the college's absurd finances, enough money mm. to buy two bottles, to mm. provide two bottles of mm. a reasonable wine. Mm. So that was good, mm. and that's nice. What about Edmund, Edmund Leach? Edmund I knew uh, very well before he became, uh, while he was still a fellow of King's, and I knew him, he was one of the first people I met in Cambridge uh, because of his interest in politics because I, when I came here I did give uh, some student society, I did give a lecture on Africa mm. uh, and uh, he came there and so I got to know him and of course his son and my son were great friends so mm. we knew the leaders quite well. Mm. And uh, I think that Edmund, uh, and of course I knew Maya Fortas very mm. well. He was a South African also. Yes. And he lived next door to me in Millington Road when we first came. Mm. So I knew Maya quite well. 
Hmm. And, uh, and anthropology has always fascinated me. Oh, good. <laughs> because uh, for many years I did uh, archaeology and uh, paleontology as a hobby, but when it threatened to become a profession, this was in <laughs> South Africa, I gave it up. <laughs> Uh, but I think that the, and I, in fact one of my great interests now are to try to create a, a new anthropology, but I'm told we mustn't call it that because people fight about it, mm. about the title. But I think now with all the advances in science and so on, we can create a unified subject which would be the study of, if you like, man and his works mm. and to try to understand our biology and our placement in the, as in the animal world, the natural world and our emergence from that into the world of our own creation mm. and how our biology not compatible with this world that we've created. So I think that's an interesting thing mm. I think we could do. Mm. Uh, and since, you know, we may even have the genome of Neanderthal man pretty soon. Mm. There's enough ancient DNA lurking around that we could probably sequence it. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, returning again to your work, you came back um, and at what point did you, later on you took over the, and founded the, um, the Institute or, um, of Molecular Biology? Um, the one in California. No, the one here? Or no, no. The what MRC. happened, yes, well let me, uh, I didn't found that. Uh, we were housed in the Cavendish Laboratory. Where, where was your room, by the way, in the Cavendish? Was it in It's the... downstairs in the basement, and we had a lab on upstairs. I've been to that room. In fact, we have been filmed in that room. The basement in... Austin Wing. The Austin Wing. And we also had the little hut, which amazingly enough is still there. Hmm. There have been a succession of... Uh, by the bicycle Rose sheds. Royce, <laughs> yes, by the bicycle sheds. <laughs> and in fact I had all of that photographed because hmm. every time I've spoken to people they said it's going to be demolished, but it hmm. still is there. <laughs> it's 50 years after they've been condemned. Yes. However, um, we were there and we had become absolute masters of obtaining space. Mm. Uh, Francis would discover somebody repairing a motorcycle in some default room which was used for physics. They'd go to Neville Mott and say, can we have the use of this room? Mm. Uh, we were great experts in spending the weekend and converting it into a working lab. So at the end of the time, we were in seven buildings on the site. Mm. <laughs> and so, of course, prior to this, the MRC had decided that then we might have an MRC building somewhere. But we told them that wasn't a good idea because we didn't want everybody who was in the MRC in <laughs> the same building. <laughs> But we formulated there that uh, we, why don't they form the MRC Laboratory of Molecular Biology, as it came to be called, and that we would join up with Fred Sainer, who was in urgent need of space. Prior to that, we had entertained various possibilities like Kendra and Perutz would stay in the Cavendish. Francis even applied for the chair of genetics and didn't get it on the grounds he didn't know any genetics. <laughs> so that's another thing people have to live down, maybe. And anyway, uh, ultimately the MRC agreed to this proposal. And they built uh, in, they were going to build out on what then was a remote site in Cambridge. Everybody wanted to be in the centre. Mm. 
The idea of getting two miles out mm. was, but eventually space was, was uh, and so that building was put up and we joined with Fred, came with us, and then we got people to come from London, Hugh Huxley, Aaron Klug, to join no. us. And that formed the lab. I see, but uh, didn't you become the... I became the director in 1970, I think 79 officially. Prior to that, I was a proleptic director, as I was called. I sometimes thought I should have been called the epileptic director. <laughs> but effectively, I did that till... Who was um, the actual director? Or? Max Perutz was. The, oh. there, there wasn't a director, there was a chairman of the board. Oh, I see. Because there was a federation, mm. and it was very useful, but the MRC wanted to bring it all together. Mm. And so we did, uh, we did, uh, of course we had lots of financial problems, uh, but uh, we had uh, had very serious cuts in about 1975. We lost uh, one quarter of our positions. Mm. Uh, it was called the Phillips Cuts. Became, became replaced by something called the Brenner Claw Pack. <laughs> I managed to get most of them back again. So <laughs> that was all right. Mm. So, and then I stopped. Uh, so when I I went on, and of course it's it's quite a job doing all of that. And uh, I decided that that was enough. You said you, it was one of the things you regretted. I regretted doing this because I think it uh, it was a lot of work mm. and uh, not for not for you know, not all administrative work is like that. But I decided so when they asked me uh, when I was fifty eight, uh, you know, did I want to go on after the age of sixty because directors were supposed to retire at 60 to this and go on to you 65 they let you go but that's a waste of time mm. so I said no I don't want to go on after 60 I want to go back to science mm. so I, you go find the successor as quickly as possible and he can take this and give me a small unit somewhere I'm going back to do science, which is ultimately what happened. And I then moved out of the lab into the medicine department mm. and uh, carried on with a small unit there, which was great fun, mm. uh, because it's always fun to start at the beginning again. Mm. Uh, and so we had a great time there, and uh, then I, when the time came for my full retirement, uh, I decided that uh, retirement was like divorce. It's a question of who's leaving whom, <laughs> as you know, may well know. But I decided I'll just stay where I am. The MRC is leaving me. <laughs> and I managed to raise enough money mm. from abroad to, uh, from companies and so on, to continue the lab until uh, that just became impossible to, to run it. But I think a lot of, I managed to find good jobs for uh, most of my people. Mm. And I think the, whatever it was, almost eight years that I spent there, was very productive in producing, you know, a group of talented people who now, of course, have important jobs in academic medicine, and in pharmaceutical companies, and mm. just generally I've done well. Can we go back to your work on the elegant, the elegant nematode? Work. Yes. <laughs> How did you get, you, you sometimes said that even more important than the picking the right question was pr picking the right um, well, subject. Yeah, I think picking the right, 
the right thing to to work on. Mm. When you see that I'd had the experience of bacteriophage. Mm. Bacteriophage was a superb example of by reducing the complexities while preserving the essence of the problem, which is how does DNA replicate, uh, allowed one to tackle it directly in what's now come called a model system. And so, as long as that preserved the central problem, then it was the correct sort of model system. It had to satisfy a huge number of conditions. One, they were easy to keep, easy to work with in the lab. Because to introduce something like that against the whole background of biology with, you know, established things. Uh, but I decided, well, I didn't care. This is what I wanted to do. And I was jolly well going to do it, because I had formulated what was the essential question. And it was the question, it's the same question that we're always talking about, which is roughly speaking, if you had the wiring diagram of anything, could you actually use it to compute the behaviour? In other words, if I knew the pattern of the nervous system, that's all I would have to know, and then I could work out how it works. By the way, uh, we did do the wiring diagram with C. elegans. It took us 25 years to do. It was a group of very talented people and hard-working people. I think maybe the second problem is now, because there are lots of people in the nematode field, the second problem will probably be solved in the next five years, because of just the nature of the, the organism. So... The, the, second, the second problem being... The second problem, how does it work? Yeah. All right? Mm. How does it work? Can you actually take it and run it mm. in the real world. Now, so, but it made me think very carefully just about the methodology of all of this. Mm. And you see, one very striking thing happened is one day Jonathan Hodgkin, who was Alan Hodgkin's son, my graduate student, now mm. professor at, uh, at Oxford, genetics, came in and said, oh, I've just done a nice simulation of the worm's behavior. And he showed me a screen, a computer screen, and there were all these things wriggling around, it, you see. And I said, that's very nice. And I said, can I see the program? So he produced the program, and I said, this isn't a proper simulation. This is a description of the behavior. Of course, all I can see is cos theta, sine theta. Mm. You're just generating waves. What I want to see is muscles, neurons, <laughs> stimulation. I want to see how the meat is working. So, they can now distinguish then between a simulation of the behavior and an imitation of the behavior. That's an imitation. And I think that to me immediately solved all the problems about that everybody's argued about the Turing test from mm. an intelligent machine. Because the way it's posed is there's no machine that's programmed with real sort of simulated neurons and so on. Mm. There's just a machine imitating an individual, mm. you know, answering the questions. So it doesn't solve the Turing test mm. because, because you have to, in other words, you have to open the box to see if it's a proper simulation. Mm. 
So I would want to, so to speak, if I had a machine in one room and a person in the other room, at the end of the day, I don't care if they are the same. I want to see who bleeds when I stick a knife <laughs> into them, for example. You know, but they should be, they should be, if it's to be scientifically valuable, it needs to actually use the machine language of the object being simulated. Mm. And that's become very clear now in doing all of this. That's what we've got to get down to, to do. But, I mean, you know, I think there's some... There, dozens of very talented young people in the field and I'm sure that problem that will be solved. But having chosen your nematode, what, what um, your main work was trying to get the wiring? No, I think we, we decided we had two problems. One was, you see, everybody was saying, well, there's genes and behaviour, right? And, of course, many people were saying, well, how do you go from genes to behavior, you see? And, of course, there were lots of discussions about this, but effectively that problem is very ill-posed, okay? Because you say, what do genes do? So genes build nervous systems. I shouldn't actually say they do, but the information in them is used. Hmm to build a brain, a nervous system, which then performs the behavior. In other words, there is a construction phase there, and unless you understand that, you cannot go from one to the other, because the mapping is through this construction, so you must understand that. So therefore, when we wanted to do this, we wanted something which we could determine the structure of the nervous system, that it should be a small nervous system, which means it should be finite. That is, we could say we've come to the end of description, and that we can then look at, as we thought then, we would make mutations and see how to alter the behavior. And then we would hope to be able to see what changes in the nervous system these mutations produced. And then we would be able to map those onto the altered behavior. Now, that program has been partly carried out, but effectively it involved doing the anatomy, it involved doing the full embryology, and the big advantage of these nematodes is they had from the literature stereotyped nervous system, constant number of cells, and the same it was thought in every single nematode of the same genetic composition. So that mean that meant we could ask ourselves under what conditions, how accurately you build a nervous system with the same genetic program. In other words, are there mistakes made in it? Is there flexibility? Is there noise? And so all of those questions could be decided with this little beast. It was easy to keep in the lab. Uh, everybody, Francis used to say, Sydney likes nematodes because they wriggle. You could actually watch them. Mm. But to me what was really important was with a few simple tools, a good microscope and some toothpicks and so on, anybody could start to do what was became sophisticated genetics of metazoan organisms themselves in a lab, by themselves with the heart paraphernalia of mouse houses and all the other <laughs> stuff. So it was this, and uh, it, ha it has caught on, as you know. Is this the work for which you got the Nobel Prize? Well, the Nobel Prize, it is the work in part. Uh, Nobel Prize gives 
gives uh, the price for discovery. So, I discovered something which had been discovered a long time ago, but it doesn't matter. <laughs> yeah. How do you mean it had been discovered a long well, time? I mean, their genes had something to do with, with organ formation, but it was the structure of it, which I think was very nice, in that they included John Salston, mm -hmm. and somebody who'd made really novel discoveries about cell death using the nematode. You see, actually, if you said you wanted to give a prize for cell death, which was given, mm -hmm. then you work out that effectively John Salston was the one who discovered there was normal cell death. And of course, neither of them could have done the work unless it had already been established as a genetic organism in a lab. So and the third person was? Um... Bob Horvitz, hmm. yeah, American. And so I think this was good. It's not, uh, so that was a good, it hmm. was good. I'm, I was very struck by all sorts of your aphorisms about how research is done, one of which was, um, the don't worry hypothesis. Can you explain what the don't worry hypothesis well, is? Well, the don't worry hypothesis is the following. Uh, there are classic examples of it. You simply have to find a plausible biochemical basis for it, material basis for this. And then it says, don't worry, there is at least one thing which, which could be the basis of it. Let me give you the most famous don't worry hypothesis, okay? People worry because the DNA strands are wound around each other. Therefore, they said it's impossible that this could be copied because the old strands would have to be unwind. Hmm. So we said don't worry, there'll be an enzyme which unwinds the DNA. Boy, there sure is about a two dozen of them that unwind <laughs> DNA. So that's a good don't worry hypothesis. Then you can get on with with the core, but if you worry and say, oh well this is gonna form an, you know, a barrier to to further progress and it must be wrong. So the don't worry hypothesis is very useful. So it's really making a guess and not worrying that it's absolutely No, it's good. making a guess. Which, which says you can take that away from your present problems and mm. try and solve the others. So mm. Don't sit and worry about this problem. See, replication, if you worried about that, you'd say, oh, well, that must mean the whole of the DNA structure is wrong mm. because it will never work. Right? So all you have to do is provide one plausible hypothesis. I did this again in... Uh, for immunological variation, in fact, we wrote it up. It was, every, somebody had written a paper to say, it is impossible, you can just mutate part of the gene. All right, so therefore, that must be wrong. So all we did is provided a plausible mechanism based on good evidence in the neighboring fields that it could be like this, but what we've shown is it's not impossible. It may not be true, but it's not impossible, <laughs> you see. Mm. Therefore, you needn't worry about that side of the thing and get on with the rest of it. Uh, I would sort of rephrase it in a way as a mental pending tray. Yeah. You put things in the pending tray, and it reminds me of... I often ask my students, what was the greatest invention of the 20th century? And um, they puzzle for a while, and I said, well, according to Bertrand Russell, it was the suspended judgment, saying we don't know yet, but let's just leave it. Well, you better not have a pending tray like me, <laughs> because I always hope the P falls off, so it becomes the ending tray. <laughs> The other thing, another of the many striking things um, that I liked about your book was um, the virtue of ignorance, which we touched on before. Um, it, it can't have escaped you, as it hasn't me, that 
many of the greatest thing, breakthroughs have been done by people on the edges of disciplines. Um, and I'd always assume that this is because they would ask the very simple questions which professionals had become forgotten the questions within their fields. Also they were obstructed by the sort of thing you mentioned which was that they knew too many of the objections to every argument. I've, I've been taught by many people who can destroy their own arguments before they're formed even. Yeah. But is that what you meant by... Yes, I think ignorance is the following, you see. If, if you don't know all the sort of things, then you never try anything. Mm. At least in our experiment, I mean, you know, and so if you did, for example, there was an experiment done by, by a postdoc of mine, and my judgment was, because I know a lot, that, it, that he was unlikely to get it to work. But I said, have a try. So he went into the cold room, he took two bottles, he did the experiment and it worked. I then went back later and calculated what was the chances of him picking up those two bottles. <laughs> the chances were about one in a million that he would get those two bottles. Hmm. Uh, because there were a thousand bottles there and he'd have to get the right two, so it's about a thousand square. Hmm. And, of course, uh, he just did it. And I asked him, how did you pick those? He says, they were in the front. <laughs> but that's why. But he didn't know how difficult it mm. was. But I held myself back. So he was ignorant. He thought, well, he'll just do this and something will happen. But, of course, the grin on his face mm. when it actually worked. But later we found there was a sophisticated, more interesting way of doing it, ab initio, without having to take chances. But we've never come to that without going through this. So one always, as you rightly say, one always knows what's wrong. Mm. One can always produce arguments to demolish mm. one's thing, but it just means that one should persevere. Uh, and of course, if, uh, if you are wrong, you'll find out sooner or later. But I notice that as, as soon as people become too knowledgeable in a given field, they are always concerned about the difficulties of doing it. And, you know, this has been tried before, it hasn't worked, no one has done this. But I think if, uh, that's why I think ignoring all of that is basically a good thing. Uh, because I think that's the only way you can innovate. Hmm. There were just two more things I, I wanted yeah. to ask you about. Um, one was, quite recently you've not only been working quite a lot in America, but also in Singapore. Yeah. What, what is your work in Singapore? Well, I went out there in 1984. Uh, they wanted some advice on biotechnology and I told them you could better set up a graduate department in cell and molecular biology because you won't do biotechnology until you've produced a surplus of PhDs in mm. that subject. And I've been involved with them and then of course very recently starting in 1999 there was a huge search forward mm. in this and so I've been heavily involved in that in building up a gigantic uh, operation there and of course one of the amusing things uh, about there is uh, they built a huge uh, set of labs there it's called Biopolis but when it was I first suggested that name and, of course, in the Singapore accent, it was pronounced biopolis, <laughs> which sounds like the police to go yes. after us. <laughs> Actually, Singapore accent is very difficult because you cannot distinguish between an air ticket mm. and etiquette. <laughs> <laughs> mm. 
Right. So I, I have just retired as mm. chairman of the, the council and I've now, as in Singapore, you know, you get mm. promoted to be senior X, mm. then mentor X, <laughs> finally you become de-mentor X. <laughs> and you've been given various awards by the Singapore government for, yeah. for this work. And the, and the last question is, um, which you may have sort of answered, but if you were giving advice to yourself as a young scientist in your 20s, starting again or starting now, um, what would you t tell such a person as to how to proceed in, to do interesting and valuable work? Well, I think it's very difficult to do it now because science has become a highly structured uh, profession with many more people in it, many more institutions involved. Uh, of course, all scientists are now, of course, involved in getting funding. Mm. So, I think you would have great difficulties in trying to do something as a young person off your own bat, mm. uh, because you need so much, you know, just actual material mm. and financial support. And so I think that's difficult, but what I would choose, I would tell such a young person, is to go to a lab, uh, not because it's a famous lab, but where there's a good mentor, somebody that you can really get the benefit of. Uh, that will help you. Uh, America is rather difficult because a graduate student is the source of semi-skilled labour, mm. some say unskilled <laughs> labour. So I think that's very difficult to do there. Uh, but I know what I did was simply go, if I got interested in the subject, I simply went and got a book out to the library and started to read. And there's quite a lot you can do, which I do now, which I think is fascinating, which is uh, which I'm very deeply concerned with a very interesting question about how we can reconstruct the past. Mm. And in fact, a few months ago, I organized a meeting on this for the Gulbenkian Foundation. Mm. And we started with the origin of the universe. And of course, I now think that we have available for free all the sequences of, all, of literally hundreds of organisms now, genetic sequences. And so I think it's a big challenge, that's what I do now, mm. is could we reconstruct the past? You know, could I actually trying to work out what happened before the Cambrian. Mm. Because I can now tell, I can now tell quite easily where we started 500 million years ago, vertebrates like mm. us. But could we go a little bit earlier than that to the origins of complex metazoans? And I think that to me is a is the fascinating thing that I think you can do because computers are cheap, mm. they are available. And I think there are a lot of subjects that you can do simply by going to the book to do this. But in my subject, which is such an experimental subject, what has now beginning to decline in it is the art of the individual solving problems. You see? I mean, one thing I've always said, and that is people have tried to divide science into pure and applied, or as some wit once said, the difference between the applied and the applicable is the same as between the despised and the despicable. <laughs> but, uh, but that is uh, neither here nor there. But of course, what science is, is a way of solving problems. It doesn't matter whether it's applied, 
and it doesn't matter what it does. So we should be judged on the quality of the problems we choose and the quality of the solutions we find for them. And that is something that I think really works. As I keep on telling people, science works. It's the best way we know of solving problems. I mean, you know, magic doesn't work. Religion is very unreliable. <laughs> science works. Mm. And so I think that's what you have to do. What is the problem you're trying to solve? And I think for young people, they should ask themselves that question. What are they burning to understand the basis? I mean, till his dying day, dying hour, Francis was interested in solving the problem of consciousness, which I, I don't think is a soluble problem personally. I think it's one of those great problems that'll just disappear. Mm. And 50 years time people will say, what the, what the hell were they talking about? What mm. were they worrying about? However, so I think for a young person, find a good problem and work on it and then try, of course, you have to gain entry into the whole apparatus of science, which is difficult. Because mm. I've always felt maybe what we should first start when we start a new lab or a new institute is a department of bank robbery. <laughs> if we could master that, we wouldn't have to worry about grants or all of the other things. <laughs>